Wait for it, wait for it, and we're live. Hey, all you crazy sci-fi and fantasy fans. It's time for your daily dose of shenanigans over here at the Blasters and Blades podcast. Just a couple of nerdy veterans geeking out over our science fiction passions and fantastical fantasies. A place where magic is king, the sky is the limit, and space is the place. We are the podcast that puts the fun in dysfunction. So without further ado, you're going to notice I didn't say one chaos coordinator because uh the stabby family are out uh house hunting if you follow their facebook uh shenanigans they were um release wasn't renewed because family stuff happens and so they have to go find a new place to live in california which is kind of scary to think about and i'm glad i don't have to do that and with that all boring stuff out of the way we get to introduce you to the guest that i was very nerding over getting here so now i get you all to myself taylor but can you introduce yourself to uh, our listeners and viewers well, my name is Taylor Anderson. I'm the author of the the Destroyerman series and the Artilleryman series. Um, and um, so, go ahead. Uh, I can't really think of anything else that's that's nerdy. <laughs> no, you're, you're okay. You're okay. We got uh, a mix of nerds and uh, um, military veterans that are follow us because this is a military themed show largely. Oh, but uh, so the next the next part of our introduction, dear listeners, how we first found them. So I actually saw ads. I can't remember if it was Facebook or Twitter or what, but I saw ads for his Artilleryman series, which is a very lovely cover of somebody getting ready to fire a what looks like a three pounder at a dinosaur of some sort. So so that had my attention because you can't go wrong with uh, firepower or um, dry, uh, dinosaurs. So, <laughs> but um, yeah, we got a, out of the way. Six pounder that I I sent pictures to the to the uh, art department so that they could get it right. As uh, someone who's not an expert on um, historic artillery, uh, have you gotten any pushback on any of the minor details that us nerds like to, to, oh, it doesn't have the right hole at the right place kind of thing? No, not really. Uh, I actually know a little bit about 19th century artillery. I've got a person, uh, currently I've got a, a six pounder, which is the the gun on the on the cover. And I also have a three inch ordnance rifle. And we used to compete with them uh, and do extremely well in point of fact. And, uh, now, unfortunately, all the competitions have kind of tapered off and the only, th only time we ever get to shoot them live is when we drag them out for the 4th of July and, and shoot old <laughs> washing machines and things like that, that have failed during the year. Do they, are they, what is the learning curve on aiming those? <laughs> Well, with the rifle gun, the, the three-inch ordnance rifle, literally, uh, you if you can see it, you can hit it. It is it is as accurate as any fire artillery piece uh, that's ever been made. I mean, it's essentially a, a, a muzzle-loading uh, French 75, which those are awesome, too, by the way. I've had an opportunity to shoot some of those. Um, but we can... We can hit an old wreck tank, which we have done numerous times down at Fort Hood, doing demonstration fire for for the Army at uh, three thousand meters. The uh, there was an old wrecked M60 sitting out there, and we put three rounds in a row down the down the commander's hatch on the top of the turret at a oh. thousand meters. What damage so, does the uh, <laughs> old artillery do to a modern tank? Well, it'll 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 knock a chunk out of the top top turret armor, and it'll it'll definitely go through both sides of a Bradley. Wow! Um, now the six pounder is just shooting round shot, and it's also a smoothbore, so it's much less accurate. But you can still hit a man sized target out to about five hundred yards. We uh, compare the two. When we compare the two, we say, yeah, you can you can hit a car pretty easily at a thousand yards with the with the smooth bore with the rifle you can shoot the mirrors off the doors nice so, <laughs> so and, uh, we shot that an is, um, ammo one time with the with the rifle gun it went in the the one of the front uh headlights 
took the top of the engine off, went through the firewall, destroyed the passenger seat, went through the back. There were a bunch of uh, uh, railroad ties stacked in the, in the very back, it launched them like tinker toys and then exited over the, over the right rear track. So <laughs> there's an awful that lot of kinetic energy true. there. I mean, if you start thinking no. about that, you, you just yeah, assume. Not, not right, right. Well, you only get one shot, so you better get it right, because they're going to figure out where you are real quick and in a hurry, like. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. You're going to have a, a big, this big cloud of smoke. Yeah, you, you, you have to take your shot and run. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. So I did, um, when I was in college, I did Civil War reenacting. And then when I went to grad as an undergrad, so I fired uh, the 1861 uh, Springfield. And they had some marksmanship competitions with that, which was fun. I didn't do as well as I would later do in the Army with my regular modern rifle. But you can only guess so much on a musket when it's uh, bouncing around just a little more. I mean, the mini ball does a little bit for accuracy, but still not what you're used to with precision modern weapons. Um, and then my right. master's degree was in colonial American history. So I got to fire some of the uh, flintlocks and those are even less accurate um, unless you're talking about like the rifleman's rifle. And th th those are it, so it all depends. What's that? The, uh, I said, it, it all kind of depends. Uh, un unfortunately with most of the military flintlocks, they have a very large lock and it's got a tremendous right. amount of lock time. And then, you have the inertia of that striking the frizzen and you get a little bit. Of, and, and even after it fires, there's a little bit of dwell time while it's in the, while the, the shot is still in the barrel that the, but the, that the musket is, is, is moving slightly just from that inertia. Yeah. And that's the problem. And, and of course they use much, you know, very oversized bores compared to the ball size in a, in a smooth bore. Uh, uh, the rifles, we're, we're generally on a par with, with modern rifles at moderate ranges. Yeah. Uh, but then you still have the, the flintlock aspect. Uh, most people that are really good with flintlocks haven't shot anything else first. You know, they start out with that. And then they, you know, when they, when they start shooting modern guns, they go, oh, wow, this is easy. <laughs> so the one, it's, it's all about advantage, the one advantage I had, and I'm sorry, dear listener, it sounds like we're talking to each other. There's a slight lag. Uh, his, his internet right now, but um, it's worth it. Trust me, stay, stay around. We had fun in the pre-show. Um, but one of the differences is modern riflemen were taught, and when I say modern, I mean contemporary to now, they're taught wearing the flag jacket. So you put center mass forward because that's where you're most protected. Yeah. I went through before that was common. So we still did the side profile stance because that exposed less of yourself when you're standing up and firing. So some of the the mannerisms that I learned, because I, I was already in the, in the guard, when I did the, the marksmanship competition with the 1861. And so some of the training did overlap, the ability to hold a steady platform, that that was huge takeaway. Um, but it's just, you know, there's only so much variance. And of course, when you're using rifles for a reenactment, you're, and it's not your rifle, because I was borrowing them, you're getting the one that's the least quality of the whatever quantity number they have, because they're only sharing <laughs> like the, the knockoff stuff with their kid brother, right? Um, and the same with yeah. when it came to, the revolution, the, there are now more than there were, but there are like riflemen rifles out there, but they're still kind of rare as far as the events that are functioning that nobody wants to let somebody else handle their baby. So that's just something I haven't done yet. Um, but it, when I when I get some country land, that is one of the first things I'm going to do is I'm going to buy some of those old rifles because now you have the range, right? Your yard. You know, I just start shooting the trees and stuff yeah. for the fun of it. <laughs> the trees it. won't see it. i got a pretty good one. And how do you we, uh, how do you manage to store your powder without it risking? I mean, back in the day, they used to have a whole you know concrete or no well bricked powder magazines. I imagine I, you I have, a, one. I have a, no. I, I do I do have a magazine. It's one of the portable magazines. Um, okay, you don't you don't need one of those if you're if, if you just have a few pounds at a time. Uh, okay, if you're, if you're gonna you know, load up a bunch of ammunition for a cannon, you. <laughs> You, you kind of need a magazine. Yeah. But, uh, I've I've been to the one at Colonial Williamsburg because it's not too far from my house. Um, so uh, you kind of imagine that you need something along those lines when you start thinking about storing. But then again, that was, you know, military uh, quantities. Well, the, that they were the, 
portable magazines are very similar to the to the limber chest of the 19th century. Okay, they were they were they were designed uh, to be, you know, they're very they're very sturdy. They're very 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 heavy, and they're designed to where that if they, if they do explode, the lid blows off the top and and it can, can confines the explosion in the sides. That's pretty much the way that that modern magazines are built. Okay, learn something new every day. It's something I definitely want to learn more of. Um, I haven't actually touched a rifle rifle since I left Iraq. Uh, I'd like to get past the the trauma to the point where I can handle that again. So that was one of the things with therapists is like, well, go old school first and start with black powder. So that's what I've been uh, I've been yeah. looking for. But you don't want to just buy anything because people will sell you garbage made in some you know third world country that like is just as likely to blow up on you as to shoot the you know you want quality. So yeah, um, you, absolutely. I've been looking at the um, the armor out of the gunsmith, excuse me, out of Colonial Williamsburg. They've actually recently started selling what they'll like they'll make to order, um, not just for the historic park. So you you can actually buy a modern made by historic standards uh, functioning rifle. So I've been thinking about saving up and just paying to get it right. So yeah, that's um, that's awesome. That's that's the way I used to build them myself. Oh, you that, used to build them using yourself? many okay. of the yeah. Yeah, when you go out to the park, and if you're on the East Coast, I highly recommend you you take a trip out there because it's kind of cool to see. You want to go at the the um, either in the heat of the summer where it's the hottest, or you want to go in the winter where they say it's the newlywed and nearly dead set is all that'll fill the park up because then you can you can have more one on one time at the various booths. But uh, seeing them actually hand bore the thing on the grind uh, wheel, it's 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 kind of cool to watch them do it the old the old way instead of just trusting a machine yeah. to do it for you so right. all right before we get too deep uh, we have to ask you the religion question so are you ready for this sir okay i think so all right star wars star trek or firefly oh i have to say firefly excellent yeah. answer brown coats forever <laughs> so and because we're polytheistic, so uh, Game of Thrones, The Wheel of Time, or Chronicles of Narnia? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, that is tough. Uh, let's see. My first experience with Game of Thrones. <laughs> okay. I was, I, was, I was out hunting with a buddy of mine, and he was, he was reading a Kindle with the, with the, the font blown up really, really big. And I just happened to glance over there and I thought he was reading porn, which I then you know, proceeded to, to mock him mercilessly about. And he, <laughs> you know, sitting in the deer blind reading porn just didn't, you know, didn't seem like the right thing to do at all. And think uh, of the deer. He, he told me, yeah. <laughs> He told me it was Game Game of Thrones, and uh, and so I, I, frankly, during that period, I never actually read any of the books because I I didn't get to read much of anything except technical manuals while I was writing the Destroyerman series, and so unfortunately, most of what I know about it is based upon the 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 HBO series, and. Uh, I really haven't haven't read much of it at all, to be honest with you. Chronicles of Narnia, I read, you know, when I was so young. I I was I was I enjoyed it. I was impressed with it. Um, don't remember much about it, to be honest. And what was the th what was the third one? Uh, Wheel of Time, Robert Jordan. Oh, yeah, un yeah. Unfortunately, I've never read any of that either. That kind of fell into the same. Yeah, you know, heard about it. Go, oh, that sounds pretty cool. But then I was in the middle of all the the shipping gun drills in 1914, and and uh, <laughs> you know, understood just just technical was out out the years. So I uh, we used to have Lord of the Rings, but that's such an unfair comparison to every other piece of fantasy literature that's come after it that it just we had to change it up. So we went with Chronicles of Narnia because it's sort of contemporary to Lord <laughs> of the Rings. Um, yeah, but yeah, it's there's the trick is is to try to find um, questions for those that fit 
across the the medium. So there's you know something maybe for them in print, something in them in video form. Because you get some people that engage in in speculative fiction only through games or only through TV or videos or whatever. So we we try to be a little bit for something for everybody with that question. Absolutely. So. All right, and because we are civilized here, we're no longer knuckle dragging traglodytes. Uh, coffee or tea, and how do you take it? Oh, both. Uh, okay. Tea sweet, tea sweet, and very cold. Coffee uh, and lots of it. You know, usually two pots in the morning. Lots, lots, and lots of coffee. Uh, so coffee is a little bit of a lot. I'll put a little bit of milk in it. Okay. So because you're from Texas, I have to ask this because my co-host is also a Texan, uh, Nick Garber, and he, he would disown me if uh, if I didn't. How do you take your steak, sir? It's a it's an appropriate Texas question. Again, there, it, it depends. If it's if it's venison steak, it has to be rare, rare, rare. Just kind of you, you sort of show it to the fire and then you use it. <laughs> And then with uh, beef steak, I like it medium rare. Okay, I um, was looking on cooking on a budget, and so I made a joke that I bought a three dollar steak from the Dollar Tree, uh, and Nick said that that's close <laughs> to disowning territory. It's like I don't know if we can still be friends, Jr. <laughs> <laughs> Although I found some YouTube videos on the quality of their steak, and, and like most of it, I guess, is water, so it didn't hold up well. <clears throat> so now that I know that, I'm not even going to try to grill it. I'm going to find some stew or something to throw it in. Maybe a chili or something. <laughs> Live and learn, right? You got to try. Sometimes the sales are too good to be true. Right. Uh, so anyway. All right. So how did you first get into, because you, so you came at this as a historian first who decided to do the alt history route of what if, which anybody who's been a history major knows when the history nerds get together, they start talking about any obscure moment in history and what would have happened if that one little moment went different. I think the famous one is if Longstreet had been there, uh, if Pickett hadn't made the charge or he had gone when he was supposed to, like there's all those pivotal moments. So what got you into going from like, let's be nerdy about history. And you were a history professor. You say that on your website to deciding to tell alt yeah. history story. Oh man, this, okay. I, I came at everything backwards. Uh, I came at my interest of history backwards. Uh when I was a when I was a kid, I wanted to go hunting, and they had O3 Springfields and barrels up at Gibson's for twenty bucks, and my my dad wouldn't get one for me, so I had to, I built a flintlock rifle out of junk, and I went hunting with that, and so I started getting interested in the history around that type of firearm, and so that's that's like I said, I kind of backed into 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 my interest of history. And then the same thing happened with the with the writing. I was I was I mean I always kind of enjoyed writing a little bit, but uh, yeah, I, I, everything I had done all my life, whether it was you know, teaching or, or building custom flintlock rifles or or you know everything uh, had, had involved you know, doing, doing his or, or working on movies, uh, had, had involved, you know, doing as much, you know, getting the history as, as, as perfect as I possibly could. But then when I, when I decided, decided to start writing, that's when I wanted to use the hard history, but I also wanted to play. And that's where the, the alternate history came into it. Uh, I was able to, I was able to use hard history, but then I could make stuff up. And make it make it interesting, well, more interesting to me anyway at the time, and uh, and also like I said, just kind of play, and that's maybe that's why uh, the Destroyman series was was as popular as it was, and uh, it was it it was a there's a there's a there's a large measure of wonder, there's a large measure of of uh, you know just fun i think that that readers can pick up on and i was certainly enjoying writing it and i still am so anyway just kind of backed into it it wasn't really a, a conscious 
I'm going to start writing alternate history. It was, it, 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 it's hard to explain really. It honestly is. So. Okay. <laughs> now that's, we all have the different paths we walk to get us here. So obviously every series starts with a, with a kernel of an idea. Um, lots of people have taken historic units and taken them through time portals. Uh, you know, the famous one is everyone likes to use the missing ninth Roman Legion. What happened to them? Well, of course, a portal and insert fun, right? Like period of history. Um, what made you decide to take quasi modern naval ships into this alternate land? Like how did the inspiration for this series come about? Well, <clears throat> I, uh, we were, we were had, I mentioned, we mentioned this during the, while we were visiting earlier, we had, a. Uh, I was working on the 2003 Alamo movie. I was, I was down there for seven and a half months, uh, doing everything from uh, the sound of the, of the weapons to, uh, you know, helping train the troops, doing armory work. And then I wound up being the, the gunner on the 18 pounder. I kept hiding from the camera and they said, they, they kept said, quit doing that. And I said, you know, whenever a cannon went off, I had to be there. So I didn't want to be the guy that they saw everywhere. And so finally I got established there, although you'll never recognize me. Um, in any event, we were having a, a, probably what would be an, an, an inevitable conversation about famous last stands. And, you know, the Alamo, uh, uh, Wake Island, uh, Thermopylae, you know, so many, so many. And, and, and didn't you didn't necessarily have to have everybody die either. It was just, you know, situations where where you're caught up in a in a in a in an Alamo like situ situation that you, you just, you know, there's, there's virtually no escape from. And I, I said, well, what about the, the U S Asiatic fleet? And no one knew what I was talking about. And I, I'd been fascinated with it and, and uh, the old four stacker destroyers and, and, and the Navy, I've always loved to sail. And so I, I just got to thinking about it. So, you know, I, I, I may, I may have to write something about that, but the more I thought about it, the more I realized that if I did, you know, yeah, it was, it was a tragic situation and, and, and hardly anybody got out after the battle of the Java sea and Houston was sunk, the Perth was sunk, the Pillsbury, the, the, uh, the Peary eventually when it got down to, to Port Darwin and, and, you know, it was, it was, it was just a, a tragic situation. And I thought, well, I think I'm going to play. And then that's how the alternate history thing kind of wound up. And, and what struck me the most was while they were fleeing from the Japanese, they actually had uh, used uh, these, these squalls. To, they, they would duck into a squall in order to, to distort the enemy range finding equipment. And the, the aircraft that were chasing them couldn't, couldn't go into the squalls and keep attacking them. And uh, there was, uh, oh shoot, <laughs> I believe it was the parrot. No, no, it was the, uh, it was, well, it was, it was one of the, one of the three destroyers that's in the, in the, in the story in the beginning that actually does get sunk because adding the, adding the, the, the Walker and the Mayhan didn't add any, any combat power really to what they, what they had. And it essentially would have just added a couple more rusting hulks on the bottom of the Java sea in, in those circumstances. I don't know why I'm having a, I'm having a, a mental block on the name of that ship, but anyway, uh, and I, I just got to thinking, well, what if they went into one of these squalls and and came out somewhere else? And that's when it all just kind of started to flow into place. It was almost almost like it was it was it was fully formed in my mind. Uh, you know, once that once that hurdle had been had been surpassed. Does that make any sense? It does. So what? you had them come somewhere. So obviously this goes into a little bit of the world building, but how did you determine where you were going to have them come out? 
Because, I mean, they could have come out at any point in history or, you know. Yeah, for that, that kind of goes into the into the. Yeah, I'm not a I'm not a huge fan of fantasy where there's where there's magic and things like that that allow you to cheat. Uh, I knew that you know they were going to have to earn whatever whatever success that they had, and you know time travel not necessarily be you know something that you could you could count on, and also having been done so many times, I decided not to not to have a time travel uh uh component instead i got to thinking okay in, in alternate histories as you said earlier usually there's some small little detail but what if they wound up on an alternate earth that had a had a, a profound difference and i started sitting around thinking about that and then it just kind of struck me what if the chicxulub impact had not occurred 66 million years ago how would that have affected sorry how would that have affected yeah that was my phone how would that have affected uh evolution how would it have affected the ecology and and of course there's there would have been other extinction events other other ice ages things like that you know during during that time and and so that Again, it was something else that I could speculate about and and uh, and play some more, you know, and 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 think in terms. Well, okay, well, what would what kind of successful form of life would have you know would have would have done the best? You know, what how how would it it have uh, changed? How would it have maybe not changed? And so it was it was. It got, got pretty involved. <laughs> oh, should. So is the Destroyer Man series and the Artillery Man series, are they linked together in the same universe, like when they cross over? They are. They are. They are. Okay. Um, so that explains the dinosaur uh, the cover. Okay. Yeah, about halfway through the, uh, the Destroyer Man series, uh, another faction or group is, is encountered that's uh situated in in roughly where the the southeast united states would be and they they wind up being kind of an important aspect of the story and i thought it would be fun to write their backstory you know essentially you know a, a century earlier how they got there and okay. they're, they're referred to in the story as the 1847 americans because that's when they that's when they crossed over, and that's where the Artilleryman series came from. It's it's, I guess you, you could call it a prequel. I mean, it's not necessarily not necessary that you read both of them, or certainly not necessary that, that you read one before the other. But the but the Artilleryman series, the events in it do take place before the events in the Destroyerman series. So how do you handle, and then we'll go to the commercial, but how do you handle resupply? Because one of the common questions they ask you when they're, you know, some of the NCO development courses, and I'm sure the war colleges, is the, the old joke, if you sent the uh, third Marine Expeditionary Unit back to ancient Rome with all the modern equipment, who wins? And of course, the answer you're supposed to get to is the Romans win, because even if every round that the entire Marine Expeditionary Unit carried killed one soldier, maybe even two, because they packed in close enough, they still have more bodies than you have bullets. And so at a certain point in time, right. if you can't shoot, move, and communicate, technology stops. That goes to say right. that resupply is a huge issue when it comes to a modern military. So how do you like work that out in your book? Is that does that play a large factor? Well, there's there's actually two different ways. Uh in in the artilleryman series, you know, they're not not significantly technologically advanced over anybody that they that they encounter. Uh, the, the, the people that they encounter also have gunpowder, for example. Okay. There are certain, there are certain tactics more than anything that they are, they are more advanced in, in, in using, uh, and, and certain aspects of their, of their, of their weaponry is a little bit better, but not, not tremendously so, uh, 
so that's a, that's a whole different story. You know, that that takes place in the 1840s when you know it was just prior to the to the cascade of technology. So they they still right. wouldn't have been aware of a lot of uh, you know telegraph existed, but it wasn't widespread. Uh, the percussion ignition system existed, but it was only in limited use. Things like that. Most most of the weapons in, that the artillerymen, you know, the small arms that they're using are flintlocks, as is, is historically the case in the U.S.-Mexican War. Uh, the Stroerman's a lot different. Uh, that In that, you have to draw upon the life experience of a lot of the people in the story. Uh, for example, their, their very first, you know, absolute, you know, oh, my God, we've got to have is going to be fuel oil right to feed the destroyer but fortunately for them you know the reason that the japanese wanted the the the, the dutch east indies as it was then uh was because basically all you had to do was poke a hole in the ground and you had virtually bunker grade crude okay and so that's that's a rather easy fix especially since a couple of the 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 the, uh, the crewmen on the ship had worked on Fort Worth sputters in Oklahoma before they joined the Navy, which was very common. And in fact, that's something that my dad did uh, in the summers between, between school. He'd work out in the oil field on, you know, using Fort Worth sputters out in West Texas. And they basically just pound a hole in the ground until oil starts coming up. And so that's, you know, that example, you know, they're fairly quickly able to, to begin making fuel oil. Uh, the evolution of their capabilities uh, in regards to small arms and then eventually larger weapons and even you know, weapon systems is a little bit more involved. But again, it, it, it draws upon the, 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 the knowledge base, the much broader knowledge base and a more advanced knowledge base that almost anybody would have had back then, you know, just based upon what the, the kind of things that they did before they, before they entered the Navy or things that they learned to do in the Navy. If you, I, I made reference to the, to the Naval ship and gun drills of 1914 earlier, that little book, <laughs> that little bitty thin book has, has everything in it from how to make cordite in, in very primitive wow. circumstances to a uh, uh, sword drill. And it's, 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 it's amazing the stuff that's in there. And if they had a small machine shop, which a four stacker would have had, in fact, I, the, the lathe that I, I learned to do machinery work with, you know, might very well have come off of a four stacker because it was, it was that primitive. And, uh, it's the same type that they used. And basically, if you have a lathe, you can make a bigger lathe. You have a mill. And eventually, you can make, you know, pretty gigantic, you know, machine equipment. And so that's that's kind of how that evolves. Um, and, and obviously, people that know how to operate them, which uh, a lot of the people in the Asiatic fleet had a, a lot of experience keeping their ships going in in pretty pretty primitive you know circumstances and so that, that was a lot of the fun of the story too i think we forget how how skilled our forefathers were and so well not even forefathers i mean we're not talking going back i mean my grandfather fought in world war ii so i think we forget how out of touch we are with those skill sets in the modern world that would have just been more common i mean i think world right. war ii was right. one of the first wars where there was uh, the well, yeah, for it were, would have been one of the first wars where the hunting rifle of the time was significantly different than the, the military rifle. Because, I mean, for the most right. part, the difference between a military rifle and a civilian rifle was the bayonet lug. I think World War II was the start yeah, the of the changing, yeah. right? So, right, like the idea that the average soldier would know how to source gunpowder to me, like, that's not something I can fathom. But I suppose in 1847 or whatever, that would have been probably more common um, for them to be yeah, able to figure the, out. 
picture with with the black powder was was fairly well known in the 1840s and in fact in in the destroyerman series before they're able to make you know modern firearms you know they're they're they start out making just regular gunpowder or black powder as, as people would refer to it now and and using that for quite a while and a, a lot of the a lot of the uh uh, bursting charges, for example, in the in the the four inch fifty naval guns, they used black powder in, in, in on the four stacker destroyers. That was what was in the in the common shell was a black powder bursting charge, and they uh, in, until they they finally you know took the Iowas out of out of commission. They were still using a black powder ignition charge at the base of the. And black powder, I mean, it's still it's still in use in, in modern militaries for dispersing uh, CBUs and 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 things like that. So, so for for people that are naval enthusiasts, don't hate me, but I will say for the average person, if you want to see what that looks like in action, we're talking about firing those guns. The scene in um, battleship where they're actually getting that old ship in use, like. Uh, some of the tactics and some of what the ship could do probably isn't right. I'm not a naval expert, so I couldn't tell you. But I will say the loading procedures were, were pretty accurate when it comes to loading the the rounds for the for the big guns. So it's it's if you're True. trying to picture it, um, it's a good way to do it. But how much did you have to research before for this, and how much of this just your gun experience as a as a weaponsmith comes into play? Well, in the, as far as the small arms are concerned, uh, I, I pretty much got everything and have shot everything that uh, I mentioned in either one of the, the series. Um, I, in fact, I've, I've, I've actually experimented to the, to the extent of <laughs> ab absolutely choking out a, a an auto ordnance Thompson with, with black powder loads. They do work. It's uh, pretty nasty. And as happens in, as happens in the story, they, 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 they throw the thing in some water to soften up the fouling. <laughs> this is not something I mean, that you would want to do frequently. When but, I uh, did reenacting, that was, that was how they did a quick clean. If the barrel got to pour boiling water down it, because it right, would soften right. it real quick. I, I'm like, I said, I can't right. imagine. That, so the, the, the modern reenactment rifles are made with modern um, metal procedures. So we could probably stand it a little bit better than a, a rifle barrel from 1860. But even still, like sometimes that'll do it. I, I've heard of people use gasoline to get some of the fouling cleaned um, as well. Right. So like, and uh, also it, it has to do with, you know, modern military weapons use jacketed ammunition. Uh, right. A lot of the black powder even the black powder cartridge guns, they used a uh, uh, they used a lube that, in in, in many cases, relied on uh, uh, beeswax as a lube. And and when you're shooting that, or or any kind of natural wax lube, it doesn't leave a lot of fouling in the barrel because it's it's not stripping the rifling, it's not letting the gun. Uh, we we that's one of the th that's kind of one of our things is we pretty much only hunt with the old traditional muzzle loaders, black powder cartridge guns, and we've recreated a lot of the old black powder cartridges, and they work just as good today as they did back in the 1870s. But you have to you have to use the right alloys in the bullets. You have to use the right lube in the in the in the grease grooves, and uh, you know, it's, it's, and, and honestly, you have to have the right kind of powder. Uh, not all charcoal is, is, is the same when it comes to making black powder. It's the same with, uh, in, in that, in that, that journal I was talking about, you know, when it comes to making uh, uh, smokeless powder that they were able, you know, to do using that as a guide. You know, it, it, it depends upon what kind of cellulose you're using, whether, you know, what, what kind of smokeless powder you're going to come up with. And all these are all these are little things that, that come out in the series that, you know, I, I try not to, to 
go off in dissertations, you know, I try to introduce these things in, in context so that the people who are interested in it can go, oh, yeah, that sounds cool. Or if they aren't interested in it, they can just read on past it. But I try to make it as, as, as realistic as, as humanly possible. And so, yeah, I, you know, it, it would be hard, but yeah, they could do these things. And, and one, of the, get- one of the things that I did for myself was if I could make it on the lathe out in the workshop, I guarantee you they could do it too. Did you get any pushback from your publisher with concern that they were teaching people how to do <laughs> these explosive type stuff? Like, was there any concern about that when you're publishing? No. No. And, and frankly, out of, out of an old, out of my own sense of, uh, uh, responsibility, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't put any, any exact recipes <laughs> in, story. in our litigious society. That's probably, yeah, I'd say, yeah. So. yeah, yeah, I, I'd say, you know, these are basic components that you need. And uh, then they get into a conversation about, you know, what kind of charcoal to use or something like that. But, you know, I, I didn't I didn't say the proportions they needed to be mixed in. <laughs> smart, smart. All right. We're going to play that commercial and then we'll come back and we'll talk about the, the destroyer men. Marked okay. for death, brothers Kildare and Zidane must complete their journey to the volatile city of Galantz. Beset with adversity. The pair are forced to rely on a reluctant ally in the hope of finding a way to save humanity from a fate worse than death. Should they arrive in time, the pair must overcome the Blood Watch, a squad of the deadliest swordsmen the world has ever seen. Unknown to the brothers, an assassin waits for them in the shadows, one who has sworn an oath to end their line forever. Orchestrating it all is Eliphas, the most powerful mages seen in centuries. Broken by the gods, Eliphas is bent on wreaking vengeance upon the world. The Raven and the Crow, The Grey Throne, written by Michael K. Falciani and narrated by Joshua Saxon. Available from Three Ravens Publishing on Amazon. All right, thank you for sticking with us through that commercial interlude. So before we dive in too deep, um, with the Destroyer Man series, what would you say the age range? Because this sounds like... As a young man, I would have loved to read this, but is it age appropriate for, we'll say, preteen, young teen readers? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> when I was writing it, I deliberately, I mean, there's, I, I would call it PG 13. Okay. And I, de- I deliberately kept it that way because, I mean, there's some, there's some, there's some, there's some cussing. For sailors, uh, there's there's a there's a, a tremendous amount of, of gory combat, but there are certain words that I don't use, and I don't go into any graphic sex scenes. And the reason I did that was deliberate. Um, at the time, I honestly i I had a I had young kids. <laughs> I wanted them to be able to read it or not, you know, young kids. My daughter wound up going into the army herself. But uh, in fact, she, she kept uh, Kipling's if on the inside of her locker while she was in basic training. And, uh, but the, uh, I, the underlying theme of the whole series is to do the right thing, even when nobody's looking, or at least what you think is the right thing. And, you know, honor and duty and, 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 you know, protecting your comrades and, and, and honoring your word to, to do what you say you're going to do. And even, even some of the more bizarre characters, like there's, there's one who's been, who's been referred to as a, as a sociopath, but he's, he's kind of the, he's kind of the Hercules of the series. And he's very particular about the people that, that he he likes, but collateral damage in protecting the people he cares about is is totally unimportant to him. And so, but at the same time, you know, you can see his growth as a character throughout the series, and he winds up caring a little bit more about, you know, maybe the cause as much as as, as 
instead of just the, 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 the handful of people that he cares about at the beginning. And uh, that's, a, that's a, a, a big part of the story as far as I'm concerned. But ultimately, I wanted, it, it's a grown-up story, but I wanted, I wanted parents to feel relatively comfortable letting their, their young adult you know, kids read it too, because the underlying message of self-sufficiency and, 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 and just, like I said, doing the right thing when nobody's looking because nobody that they knew before they went there, you know, are ever going to find out what they're up to. I thought that was important as well. And I get, I get a lot of contacts from, from younger readers as well as, uh, old veterans and, uh, and those are, all of them are humbling, but, uh, you know, when I, when I, when I hear from somebody who, 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 who joined the Navy after reading the story, I'm saying, well, it's a different Navy now, but that's okay. I'm very proud of you. And I'm, I'm and thanks for your service. And, and it's just, it's, it's humbling. It really is. And, uh, so maybe. Yeah, and, and honestly, there I just don't think there's enough good stories out there for young people to read anymore. I grew up reading, you know, Treasure Island and, and Heinlein, you know, his early stuff, uh, you know, Red Planet and Farmer in the Sky and stuff like that, where where kids were able to identify with the, the young people in the story engaged in the adventure. And they could root for the you know the people doing the right thing. And there's not a whole lot of that around anymore. And that that's why I wanted to keep it like that. Okay. And I know we talked about this in the pre-show, and I know the answer to this, but a lot of people in some of your reviews, because I kind of mind the reviews to help pivot the, the conversation, seem to be under the impression that you got the Navy so right that you must have served. So did you serve in the Navy? <laughs> no, no, I didn't. And this, this I recently visited the, USS Alabama, which is a, she's a beautiful old lady. And, uh, no, I've always, I've always had a thing for the Navy and, and ships and the sea. And I love to sail. Um, you know, like, like all my friends in, in high school or, you know, our, our idea was to, to get out of school and join the Marine Corps. But unfortunately, you know, I had <laughs> played football for a number of years before that. And it thrashed up my knees pretty good. And it's it may, may be a good thing because a lot of the guys that that uh, went off at the same time I would have wound up in that that Beirut bombing. And uh, it's but the the people who have served are very close to my heart. And most of my friends have served. I mean, true friends I've been through, you know, some pretty, pretty rough times with. And uh, I, 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 I couldn't imagine anybody that I would want at my back more than them. And I'd be there for them, too. So speaking of getting the sailors right, did you lean then on your friends that served or did you lean on your research more when it comes to getting the the sort of culture of the naval ships at the time right? Oh, mostly <laughs> one one little anecdote. Uh, there's, there's a pair of characters that are referred to as the mice. They're both a, a couple of uh, engine room snipes, fire firemen. And they were both based on one person. And unfortunately, he recently passed away. He was uh, a guy that uh, Vietnam era uh, Navy, although he was he was he served on a on a World War II uh, fleet boat uh, Gato class. He was a, a motor Mac. And. uh <laughs> very colorful character. We used to, we used to say that he had, he had drunk way too much torpedo alcohol back in the sixties, <laughs> but he, uh, 
the reason I was able to to model both of these characters off of him was because he he was very insular, uh, very standoffish, but he he knew his he knew he, he the, to watch him pantomime starting up a pair of Fairbanks Morse diesels was a it was it was like a like a ballet, and it was hilarious. But at the same time, you know, he, he, he didn't seem like there was a whole lot there when you talked to him, unless you asked him anything about the Seven Years War. And if you did, he was an absolute encyclopedia. He knew everything about the Seven Years War that you could ever find in a book. It was amazing. I've never seen anything like it. And so he... His, his personality lent itself to be basically snatched up whole to make two different characters out of. And he, and, I, and he knew it and he loved it. He thought it was hilarious. And uh, <laughs> I, I sure miss him, but he, he, uh, he was a heck of a guy. And that's the way most of the characters are. Um, all of them are composites except for, except for those two. And uh, and in their case, they they each have you know, one of his his personalities, but all the other characters I would I would consider to be composites of of people I have known um, who 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 had you know various attributes and various personalities and various character traits and. Uh, that made him a lot more real to me as I wrote him, and I think it made it made him a lot more real to readers as they as they got to know him in the story as well. You quickly realize when you serve in the military that a lot of those military character tropes exist for a reason. Um, although up until recently, I would say the military was a cross cross section of American population. Um, you know, that, that going past that would get, get too political, so we won't do that. But so it, part of the reason those characters can be related to is because you knew that guy, even if you didn't know Sailor Smith or whatever, because you grew up with that guy that was, you know, always duct tape and MacGyver and something together. Yeah. Yeah. Like They exist for a reason. So it's if I was going to do it, because I was invited once to write in an alternative history anthology, and I ended up having to pass because timing. But the hardest part for me would have been trying to get the language right because there's the danger of assuming that they speak like we speak. But some of that is different, like the verbiage, the terminology. Yeah. But it's also not leave it to beaver, golly gee whiz, either. So how did you go about right. getting that part right so the dialogue felt real? That was... <clears throat> That was a little oddly enough. I, I I told you I was always more of a 19th century guy, but oddly enough, the the, the artilleryman series has been harder for me in that respect than the art than the, than the destroyerman series was because I grew up around people talking like that, you know, that 1940s style of. In fact, most of the people I know still kind of talk like that. Uh, I was able to, you know, if, if, if I was curious about a, you know, whether a, a phrase was an anachronism, I could just, I could ask my dad yeah, and that helped a lot or other people that I know. When I, when I started writing the, the artilleryman series, it, it, I started out in full Patrick O'Brien mode <laughs> and because there was a totally different way of talking back in the mid 19th century. And it suddenly dawned on me when I'd had it, I had it about halfway finished and I'm thinking, you know, the, the readers that are used to the style that I write are going to hate this. And, and I, not that, not that, you know, anybody should hate Patrick O'Brien mode by any means. I mean, I, I love it, but it, it does take a little bit of transition time to get into it. And it's a totally different style. And so, what I did is, is I went back and I, I kept some of the, the, the period correct dialogue, but the, the, narr the narrative is, is more similar to the Destroyerman series. And I, I, I 
explain that by kind of implying that it's written by Courtney Bradford, who is, is known throughout the Destroyerman series to be writing uh, a series of books. <laughs> and so it kind of implies that it's written by him. So I kind of I kind of got away with cheating on that one a little bit. And so the implication is that it's a history book of the events as opposed to kind of kind of implies that it's it's at least influenced by that yeah and right. so that that enabled me to kind of kind of wiggle out of the <laughs> out of the Patrick O'Brien mode to some degree and I think make it more comfortable for for people that were that enjoyed my style of writing you know, to, to, to transfer to that, that different series without, you know, a, 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 a major, you know, crashing of gears and slipping of clutches as it were. So the destroy man series, I'm going to throw the cover up while we talk. So how much um, say did you get in the, um, in the covers? Well, it, it all, <laughs> It started in the first one when you can you can see there that the end of the storm, you know, they when they when they first sent me the cover art, it was basically a Fletcher class destroyer. And I said, that's not gonna work. Well, why not? Because I mean what 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 pops into people's minds when you describe a des describe a destroyer? Well, Fletcher does, or something similar. You know, they're beautiful ships. They, they they certainly are, but they're not four stackers, and they were never in the Asiatic fleet. Right. And so I was fortunate enough to win that fight. <laughs> and I sent them pictures. I said, this is what it's got to look like. And uh, and they they did. They put it there. And I think that's that's one of the main reasons that, that people picked it up when they wouldn't ordinarily have done so. Yeah. The, uh, the cover, I am not normally a fan of trad pub covers. I'm not going to lie. A lot of times it looks a little more artsy fartsy than I would like. Um, and it is definitely um, seeking a different audience than me when it comes to like military sci-fi, but Oh my goodness, your covers pop like this one with the, the World War II and the ship of the line uh, sailboat uh, on the cover. Like these are just, they're amazing covers. I'm going to, while we, we talk about that, I'm going to go through just some of them so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. Um, you lucked out on this one as far as covers go. I was, I was very fortunate in that they apparently you know, recognize that, you know, how, how important it was that the, that, the, you know, the, the be recognized that, that, uh, that this destroyer was, was very primitive, it was an important part of the story. And, and, uh, and the fact that it's a four stacker was important. And the, uh, yeah, this, a lot of the, and, and, and a lot of times when I would, they would say, well, what, what does that look like? Or what does this look like? And I would send them pictures. Those pictures of those aircraft in that are actually based on, on some that I drew that the, the people in the series actually create. And they're, they're pretty close to what, what the, as they're described. And uh, <laughs> I don't know why the, the, why the propellers aren't spinning on those, but, and there, there winds up being a, a, a stash of P40Es in the story, although I, I dodged another <laughs> trope with that because as uh, the story goes along, you think, oh, this is how, how convenient they found a, a stash of P40s. Well, first they have to get them out of a, out of a, a jungle swamp, and then they have to put them together, and they have to learn how to fly them, and then they wind up being hanger queens for most of the entire series <laughs> yeah. because they can't risk them, you know, because <laughs> they can't even replace the Prestone antifreeze. So, yeah. The, um, the covers. Oh my goodness, sir. You, you, they're, they're works of art. I love them. 
Um, and the covers on the artillery men are also good. That's what caught my attention and why I reached out to you. I'm like, this is, looks too cool. Um, it's like my my uh, my inner twelve year old boy uh, drew a cover. <laughs> so, with these, like obviously, you've got various timelines, various tech trees, as it were. Um, if you look at if you looked at through the covers, um, and I'll if, for those of you that are listening, I will link to the um, the series page on Amazon so you can you can scroll through and, and look at all the covers. How did you determine where the enemy on this new new continent this new this new alternate earth like how did you determine where they started and what the the yin yang would look like because most people don't realize that technological advances don't happen in a vacuum when it comes to war you do x your opponent does y so you have to counter it with z and so on and so on and so some of what you see as development is a result of countering what the other guy did so how did you play that along to the point where you've got zeppelins and such? Well, and in that like one, there's yeah, in the in the the storyman, well, in the artilleryman series, there hasn't been a tremendous amount of technological advance because, like I said, they're 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 facing people that that are roughly equal when it comes to that, and they don't have a tremendous they don't have even the potential for a, for a tremendous amount of tech, uh, uh, industrial capability. Uh, in the Destorium series, it was, it was another story. And, and when, when the USS Walker and USS Mahan, which were both real ships, by the way, they just didn't have wartime uh, records. And uh, I don't like, I, I, I don't want to, I don't ever use ships that had a wartime record because I think it's disrespectful to the, the actual records that they had. And, uh, but when they went through the squall, they were going one direction while they were in, in knife fighting combat with a, with a, a battle cruiser named, uh, Amagi, a Japanese battle cruiser, which also existed, but it was, it was destroyed in that, uh, 1922, uh, yeah, the, I think 1922 earthquake in Japan, and it, it would have been the sister ship to the Akagi, which was turned into an aircraft carrier. But if it had been completed as a battle cruiser, which implies from the very beginning that we're dealing with an alternate universe, uh, <clears throat> it's it winds up uh, crossing over as well, and so they they they've got antagonists that not only you know are at their same technological level but they have a much more powerful ship that they have to cope with and so that that spurs a lot of the the necessary um technological advances that they have to make so in the beginning when they go through the squall do any of their japanese opponents end up over there with them yeah, that's what I'm. That's what the I was talking about. The the Amagi did, although they don't know it in the first book. Not until okay. the second book do they realize that. Uh, and I just kind of blew that away. But <laughs> so but not so until the long second story short, the uh, they carry the war with them. They don't let it go and team up. <laughs> obviously, um, to some degree, yeah, yeah. Now there there's a little bit of crossover back and forth, but. Uh, uh, you know, like the, the Japanese wind up with some some Americans that 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 aren't necessarily, you know, productively, you know, helping, and and then the, the Americans wind up with a particularly uh, formidable Japanese sailor who uh, winds up, ironically, being you know one of their their highest ranking uh, land force commanders. <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 strange how it all works out. So, just for for point of reference, because you know I'm not an expert, like I said, naval folk. I focused on infantry tactics and, and guerrilla and and you know that kind of thing. But did these ships have marine complements on them that would have you know given them some versatility for ground stuff, or was it all yeah. sailors? They were all sailors, but one thing in in the Asia, with with one exception, the. Uh, the 
Asiatic fleet sailors were, were frequently called upon to act as Marines. Uh, okay. On the, you know, in China, for example, up the Yalu River. And, you know, the, the just, it was sometimes just referred to as the China Station. Right. I've uh, heard of that. They would, they, yeah, they'd spend part of the year, you know, based in Shanghai and part of the year in the Philippines. And most of them loved it. Most of them intended to retire there. Uh, a lot of them were, were kind of considered the, the the redheaded stepchildren of the Navy, but at the same time, that's you know, they just they loved it. But obviously, the the outbreak of the war pretty much ended that whole that whole way of life. Um, but <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, trying to remember the the initial point I was trying to make the uh, uh, so they they had they had enough experience as sailors with their master at arms that they didn't necessarily need uh, Marines to function with ground forces is what you're saying they did to an extent now they also wind up with the, the with the advantage of when they're abandoning Surabaya when the Japanese are invading the the north end north northwest end of Java uh, a lot of the, the, the people that were stranded there, you know, were trying to get out any way they could. And they, they carry off, oh, some, 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 some Navy nurses that had been on the Langley when it was sunk. And they also carry off, a, a, a Marine sergeant who had been in the Marine contingent on the USS Houston in the aft turret when it was, when it was hit. And he'd been offloaded, wounded, and therefore that's that's why he wasn't on the Houston when she was sunk. But he he comes aboard, you know, say, hey, yeah, I want to ride out of here too. And so they wind up with with you know an experienced uh, Marine NCO, okay, helping with you know some of the training. And and there are other crossovers too. Uh, you also have to remember that at this time there were there were a lot of there were quite a few people especially i would say in the asiatic fleet who had served in other branches as far back as world war 1 wow okay the, yeah the uh and they wouldn't be that old yet but you know what was going on in, you know back in the states depression and so people joined the military so they could get three square meals a day and if they had prior service, this sometimes helped them get in. And so, you know, for example, there, there's one character that's, uh, uh, he, he starts out on a, on a, on a, uh, an S boat, a submarine. And he winds up, you know, it, it turns out that he had been an infantryman in world war one. So he has some infantry, you know, experience and, so there's kind of kind of shifts and I mean kind of kind of in, in fits and starts they start building you know land forces as well which ultimately in the series as as things get pretty pretty epic in scope they have some land battles that are just titanic and and their their their, their sea battles are humongous as well so it starts out pretty small and then it just uh, gets gets huge. So obviously attrition would be an issue at that point. So you obviously, based on the covers, there at some point they build uh, the ability to manufacture more. Yeah, yeah, they do. And uh, <laughs> I took I took a little bit of flack for for naming so many of the characters who didn't really participate very much in in the first book. You know, so and so. You know, instead of referring to you know some uh uh electrician's mate or something like that as you know as just you know some some nobody electrician's mate i actually gave him a name see why did you do that well <clears throat> as the series progressed and people die and a lot of them die these people step up and become you know tertiary secondary primary characters and but they didn't come out of nowhere. You know, the reader knows, okay, yeah, I remember that guy. 
And so it, it, it just made more sense to me than to say, oh, yeah, so-and-so was on, on Mahan or, or Walker or something. Oh, really? I don't remember him. Well, his name is mentioned at that point. So, yeah, they, they were, you know, there was, there was precedent set for them to be, to be present in the story. So did you end up closing the arc at the 15th book, or is there more to come from the Destroyer Man series? Well, yeah, the the arc is certainly closed. Um, I haven't announced it yet, so I guess this is as good a place and time as any. But uh, there will be a... Uh, I'm, I'm currently working on the fourth and final Artilleryman book. And when I finish that, there will be a, a, a book that takes place um, let's see the best way to describe this. I will revisit some of the some of the well-known characters from the Destroyerman series. And I, I think people are gonna get a big kick out of what they're up to. Okay. Well, that's encouraging. Um, so when you hear this, uh you heard it here first. Um hopefully by the time this airs, that's still true, but yeah, what can you do? Um so <laughs> Once you're done with the artillery man and you wrap that up and you've got the 15 books and the destroyer man, and then this new venture that you're going on, are you going to go to other non-connected alternative histories or do you think you're going to stick in this world? Oh, I don't know. There's, I, <laughs> I've, I've tinkered on things that, uh, that, that I enjoy and, and I, I could, I could, I could, frankly, I could stay in this, in that universe forever and never finish writing fun stories in it. I think that I would probably like to, you know, like to do some different things from time to time. Certainly, uh, who knows? I might write a space opera for crying out loud. But <laughs> it's fun. The water is warm. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's just kind of. It's kind of obviously a matter of what I, what I want to play with at this point. But you uh, know, the you, interesting thing is it'll 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 almost I don't know if I'll ever be able to get completely away from some historical aspect. Yeah. Because my <laughs> I I'm I'm i my friends already say I'm probably the only science fiction writer who who has had O three Springfields and Craig Jorgensen's and 1911s. Well, I take that back. I know David Weber has has a 1911 in some of his Honor Harrington stories, but I'm I'm almost certain as far as the artilleryman series is concerned, nobody else has ever put a put a hall carbine or a or an 1817 rifle or or things like that. And I get a I get a kick out of that sort of thing. And uh, particularly the crags in the in the Destroyerman series, they 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 show up in a crate that probably came with the ship. It's it's speculated, and uh, some of the characters are, are wagging these crags around. And some of my buddies that that wanted decided they wanted to get a crag said, "All of a sudden, those things have gone through the roof. You've killed us. You know? <laughs> what are you talking about?" <laughs> The uh, there for a while, the are pretty expensive. Oh, if I was to blame a lot, I'm sorry, what I said, they're expensive now. They used to be like the AK 47 of the historic weapons, like there were so many of them you could get them, yeah. and then collectors started wanting them, and suddenly it got a little pricey. I've, I've looked at some myself, and I kicked myself for not having bought it a couple years ago. <laughs> um, well, I like a Craig, I don't. Hey, you, if you can get a pretty good, if you can get a decent beater with most of the, the the furniture, Criterion is making a new barrel for them that works really well. And I made a so, 96 speaking, being out of one. I don't know if it's a good idea to, to plug in for people on your, on your, your podcast. Oh, you're fine. You're fine. So you mentioned getting fuel and then you mentioned building rifles, obviously to build ships, you need metal. So is that something that the average um, machinist mate would have known how to do to source that and then refine it? Not necessarily. 
but that's starting to get into some plot points that I don't really want to. Oh, absolutely. Uh, no spoilers here. Because because they, they'd be pretty bad spoilers. Um, okay. But they, they, they do wind up with various sources of steel. Yeah. So one yeah. of the things you go ahead. I, I would, I was just going to say some, some fairly believable sources of steel, not just magic. You know, they don't, they don't, <laughs> they don't get anything gifted to them. <laughs> Absolutely. Everything these poor guys wind up with, they have to work really hard for. Yeah. That's um, one of the things you that, run that into is like, it kind of goes back to my aversion to magic, I guess. Yeah. Well, one of the things you run into is people know how to use equipment, don't necessarily know how to build it. Um, so, like, I right. could drive a car, but that doesn't mean I understand how a combustion engine works, for instance. And so you right. run into that a lot. Everyone's like, oh, I just build the thing. Well, okay, but are you going to, do you know how to build the factory to build the part to build the thing? No, most people don't, um, which, which right. makes things like, you know, just bringing the tech more complicated. I think. The um, 1632 series goes into that a little bit, but they start farther back, so the tech is a little more primitive. Um, but yeah, it's it's an interesting concept. Um, do you think if you're going to play in this world, would you want to go further into the future and bring more modern stuff through, or would you want to go farther back in time and bring more historic units through? I don't know. Um, <clears throat> I. That's a tough question. I, I can see I can see fun stories in both directions, and and even going you know way back, I can see some fun stories. But uh, I don't I don't think that I would I don't think that I would bring it up to the present day. I could just see some of the early tanks from like the the Western Front, for instance, could be interesting to bring across with some of the creatures you have. <laughs> Um, just some of that tech, uh, obviously the mustard gas and all that's kind of gnarly, but we don't even know that that yeah. would work the same if you're talking about non-humans. That's right. So, and that's, and that's, that's actually like, you know, you know, gas comes up as a, as a, as a subject of discussion. Um, you know, it's, it's none, none of them are going to be real keen on its use. Every one of them would have known people that were gassed in the trenches. Yeah. Uh, you know, I had a great uncle who was gassed in the trenches. So it's, it's, that would, that, that's a, that's a major, you know, moral dilemma to, to they, they wind up faced with another moral dilemma that uh, I, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> Just let people, let people find it as they, as they read along. It'd be interesting to see if any of the Germans made it over at various points as well. Different well, mentality with those soldiers yeah, versus I mean, the Japanese, for instance. And if they did, did they come from the from the same exact alternate universe? Oh, that's another thing to think about. Yeah, you're talking about the infinite possibility of universes. So, yeah. and at any one point you change the history, like I've seen um, Harry Turtledove did with, well, if the South won the Civil War, what does World War One look like? When now you've got an American front, North and South, fighting on a trench. So it's it's a lot of room to play. Um, so before we wrap this up, it's on my list, sir. When I get $100 to buy all 15 of them, I will. Um, if you could live, if you could live in this world, the uh, the alternate Earth that you sent your people through, would you? Oh Lord! From a my 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 twenty year old adventurous self says absolutely. You know my my more more mature <laughs> self with all my aches and pains says, eh, I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> I had that same realization. I went to one of the guys that uh, I served with who didn't make it home. His son recently got married. So I went to his son's wedding and he, you know, because he didn't get to spend much time with his father, obviously, uh, I, that was sort of my role was to keep those stories alive for him. And now I, at 42, I tell those stories to him and I look back, I'm like, what the hell were we thinking? Why didn't someone tell us this was a bad idea? <laughs> so, so there's a perspective changes some of that for you. Oh yeah. Yeah. 
you know, every, every morning you get up and it's just, uh, uh. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I played rugby too, so I feel you. You feel every one of those bad hits. Yeah. Oh, I mean, we used to, we used to snatch those, those guns up and run around with them and they're, you know, they weigh a ton and, you know, and, and just heave them around and, and, and load them up on the trailers and stuff like that. And, and now, yeah, you know, I, I was, I was driving the tractor the other day and I was, I was heaving something around on that. And I'm thinking, how did I ever survive without a tractor? I did the <laughs> same stuff. You know, I mean, I, I, but now, I mean, just without even thinking about it, you just go get the tractor to pick something up, you know? And so, so did you but, keep the, the flora and fauna roughly the same? Cause now you mentioned tractor and I'm thinking some of those old cannons were pulled by horses. Did they have horses? Did the flora and fauna change? Did you go into like new ecology? Oh, 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 and, and artillerymen. Yeah. Uh, they, yeah, they've got, uh, they've got some horses now. Also, you you'll, you you may or, or may not know that that horses initially uh, evolved in North America, but they I, but they went the extinct. Aware. Yeah, and and so yeah, there's there's some horses. There's they're kind of strange, but there's some horses. Yeah, they were just like there were. And, got, and they, have a, they have they have a few that survived. Um, it's. The crossover events in the two different series are, are are similar, but they're 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 much more traumatic in the artilleryman series. For one thing, you're talking about people at a time when they they had absolutely well, it's 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 a it's a totally different time period. You you uh, for example, you know what what are they going to think when they see something like a dinosaur? The word dinosaur had only existed for a decade. Yeah, uh, the the depictions were totally different. Um, you know, you hadn't even started having the big evolution debate yet. The biggest debate was was what had happened to all the creatures that had gone extinct because the debate was that extinction could not exist because then that would imply that God had made something imperfect. And so that was a huge debate at the time, even before the evolution debate began. And so Interesting. You're gonna, you know, you've got all kinds of things that are going to be going through these guys' heads. You know, what, what, are, what are these things, demons or what? You know, and it's pretty much only only the, the, the only thing that saves them is, is, is the discipline of being soldiers. And in that, there's, there's difficulties because the U.S. Army at the time was composed primarily of, of Irish and Scottish and German immigrants and, and people from all, you know, many other places as well that, uh, you know, had, had very different beliefs, very different religious beliefs. And so they're going to have to get, get on the same page as far as that's concerned. Um, you had some pretty brutal uh, punishment practices that were very un, unpopular among the troops. So you've got to you've got to strike a balance there of, of, of how how are you how are you going to enforce discipline without being a tyrant and how are and, and how how are they going to react to that? You've got to you've got to get them all on the same page. And you know, this this is how we're going to survive, is, is we're gonna to have to do it this way, but you're gonna to have to make some adjustments too. At so, least at least the good officers will. So the other question that leaves you is most, this is a problem in sci-fi too. They got a colony, like Stargate was famous for it. There's like five families on this planet and somehow they don't have inbred issues. Obviously most military units that you're bringing over are largely male because that's just the, the military of the time. It was the men that went to fight. So how do you handle building a sustainable culture when you know the number of nurses that they could have brought over would have been minuscule? Well, in, in the Destroyerman series, in fact, uh, at first, when they only have a very limited number of nurses on board the ship, and and they start realizing that, hey, you know, so far we haven't seen any other human people, you know, and that's that's when that's <laughs> one of the one of the one of the characters coins it as the Dame Famine. And <laughs> I like that. 
there's a, you know, they, they start realizing this could be a serious problem as, you know, going, going forward. But uh, then again, without, without, you know, too many spoilers, you know, since, since they are there, there is a, you know, they, they begin to suspect there's a fair chance that there may be other human people there too somewhere. But at first, yeah, it's, it's a big problem. You've got these Asiatic fleet sailors who, you know, their, their idea of a good time is a night in the Longapo. And, you know, this, this, this Dame famine is <laughs> really, really a problem. And, uh, but, it, and at the same time, you've got these, these, these nurses who, for the most part, you know, <sighs> I think in a believable way, you know, of course, at first they're treated like, you know, women would have been back at that time. And, but they're, 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 they're much more capable than, and, and, and this becomes clear to everybody that as everybody steps up and has to assume more responsibility, you know, they're able to do so as well. And they become pretty badass. And, and that's kind of an ongoing theme in the story, not just, uh, you know, not just with the, with the humans that they encounter, but the other non-human uh, characters. Um, a, a lot of the, the, the prejudices that, that, that people would have carried with them into a world like that, uh, particularly after they have shared, you know, life-threatening situations with a lot of the the, the 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 surface differences, and I'm sure you know this, just kind of vanish. And the underlying commonalities and, and things that you're working together for, the things you're trying to accomplish, you know, those those become the, the primary things that you that you that you you know base your opinion of other people on. You know, how 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 good they are at what they're doing, how good they are at, at, you know, how good a friend they are in a bad situation. And so it's, whereas, you know, race and, and, and things that would divide them could have been a, a serious problem that wind up being almost unimportant. In fact, entirely unimportant as so they as you, they fight to survive do you cover any of the i mean the, the asiatic fleet would have been more uh racially integrated probably than the the european one if my understanding of history it's been a while since i studied this era but do you cover some of that uh turmoil that might have yeah. come with them yes and there's a uh, one one particular character who's who uh, gets gets dealt with in an unpleasant way? Who's who's who? who well, again, I don't want to. I don't really want to. He he does something that that helps create help, helps create one of the characters who starts out being one of these tertiary characters and winds up being a primary character, and uh, something he does you know, causes her to be the way she is. And it winds up being very important to the overall plot of the story, but it, it costs seem pretty bad. <laughs> but, so have uh, you been surprised? For example, or go ahead. Oh, um, in the, in the Asiatic fleet, you've had primarily uh, Filipinos on the, on the ships as mess attendants and, and, and things of that nature. Many of them were inducted into the Navy. Uh, some of them, when, when the ships were ordered to pull out of the Philippines, they, they jumped ship, understandably. You know, they had their families to protect. But there are, there are a number of Filipinos on the ship as well. And, you know, as, as time goes along, you know, they, they're, they're just as important characters as anybody. Whereas originally, had they stayed on, on the ships, they probably would have stayed mess attendants and things like that, because that's all they were allowed to do. And uh, that's that's kind of a, a ongoing theme throughout the story. 
uh, throughout the series, and that is that uh, you know it's it's the internal and not the external <laughs> that that begins to to be important to people. And that's another reason I think that it's it's a good story for for youngsters to read. Absolutely. So, have you been surprised by how well this was received? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I started out just writing an old-fashioned adventure yarn with a twist, and uh, I, I I finished it up and sent it off, and and uh, got a got an amazing agent right away, and. Next thing I knew, I had, you know, pretty much all the major uh, pu publishing houses in a bidding war over it, which wow. I was, I mostly missed because <laughs> I was in the hospital at, a, at the time. <laughs> I had a, I had a, a pretty bad situation happen. And uh, I had, I had a, I couldn't decide whether this was, this, this is really happening or if I was just in a Demerol dream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, well, this is, this is intriguing. I'm definitely going to have to read this and write a review. And when I do, I'll post it to upstream and then I'll, I'll link it dear listener to the, um, the Facebook group, the Twitter, all the places where, where we post, but uh, I have a lot more questions and I feel like the answer is going to be, you got to read the book, no spoilers. So as we wrap this up, cause I will ramble about history forever. And normally I have someone here who's got like the hook at the end, you know, to pull me off stage to shut me up. Uh, but it's just us today. So that can be a dangerous thing. So is there anything about the destroyer man series in the universe that becomes the artillery man as well that I didn't ask that you think listeners and viewers should know? No, I don't think so. Uh, it, I mean, it's like I said, real. I mean, it's actually kind of the other way around, but it doesn't really matter. You can. Oh, there's there's a few little Easter eggs here and there. If you're reading the Artilleryman series and you've already read the Destroyerman series, you, you might say, "Oh, okay, he must be so and so's great grandpa or something like that." But for the most part, they can they can very easily be read independently. Um, and then of course, if you read the artilleryman series first, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the mystery associated with, with these, these people that turn up in the middle of the Destroyerman series won't be quite as mysterious. And I don't know if that's a good thing or not. I think it was kind of fun, but, uh, you know, it's, it's entirely up to the reader, but it's certainly not necessary that you read, you know, one before the other. Yes, but the Artilleryman series, if you start it now, is a lot smaller investment to get hooks because there's only three and then, you know, one more book coming. So for someone approaching it, you know, late to the game, the numbers aren't quite as intimidating, I would say. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, it's – I'm trying to think which – you know, if, if I was to – if I was to suggest – to somebody which one to start with i would probably have to still stick with the destroyerman series just from from that that standpoint yeah. because you know it's 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 not not because it's 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 bigger i i, I might make a few more a few more dollars off of royalties but because it's it's oh there's value it's got a lot more. I'm with you. There's, 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 there's more wonder. There's more, um, you know, holy smoke. You know, what's that kind of, kind of, kind of stuff going on, particularly in the beginning. Whereas with the with the artillerymen, they're faced with the same many of the same circumstances, but they don't they don't they have to be a lot more serious about it. And maybe that's what it boils down to. It's a, it's a more stoic time and there's not quite as much room for the, the really funny banter and things like that, that I was able to engage in, in the Destroyerman series, if that makes any sense. It does. 
So, all right. And then um, as we wrap this up, this is the part, dear listener, where I remind you to please be kind and speak your mind on the reviewing platforms. Your reviews help the right readers find the right books. So do your part. And I hear if he gets his uh, 5,000th review, uh, his publisher might give him a new gun or something. It could happen. You never know. (laughs) And who doesn't need another flintlock, right? (laughs) So how can listeners find you on the wild, wild interwebs? Well, I've got my my <clears throat> my website at uh, TaylorAndersonAuthor.com. Uh, I've got a I've got an author Facebook page, at Taylor Anderson author, uh, author and destroyerman and artilleryman, and that's really about it. Uh, I don't do a lot of social media stuff, although I keep telling myself I need to get in more more into Twitter and things. But uh, if you if you make a comment on the on the, the Facebook page or my or my uh, web page, I'll certainly I'm pretty good about re- responding. And I love to hear anything about, you know, if you read the books, I love to hear what you thought. It makes my day. <laughs> Absolutely. And reviews do help people It help the other readers, if you like something, say, hey, this is worth my time. So, you know, even if he, he doesn't read all the reviews because not authors do, they still help uh, other writers or other readers find the books, which in turn buys it, which tells your publisher or if they're self-published, tells the author, hey, these are popular. Let's write more of them. So you're, you're helping yourself when you review a book because it's how you get more of what you love. So I will link Absolutely. to his I will link to his uh, Facebook page, his author Uh, page on Facebook. I'll link to his website and his Amazon page. Uh, He is traditionally published. So these are wide. If you prefer the Barnes and Noble or any other sales uh, venues, you will find them there. Um, And you can find us on our link tree, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E, link tree slash Blasters and Blades podcast. Again, link tree slash Blasters and Blades podcast, where we link to all the things, the bit shoots, the rumbles, the YouTubes, where Twitter and our email, you can find our Facebook group or Facebook page. And more importantly, we can find Madam Stabby Stabs, Instagram, Twitter, and email, where you can send all of the hate mail and rude and lascivious, well, not lascivious, just rude comments. Her husband does know how to make targets go away at a long distance. So maybe... Maybe uh, manage your expectations, dear listener. Uh, I don't want to be responsible for anybody getting hurt. And with that being said, you can find us on our website at anchor.fm slash blasters, tack and tack blades. Again, anchor.fm slash blasters, tack and tack blades, where for as little as 99 cents a month, you can help keep the lights on. These episodes aren't free to pre aren't free to produce and we appreciate every little bit that you can throw towards keeping the lights on for the next year we have uh where you can support the show more directly at buymeacoffee.com slash author jr hanley again buymeacoffee.com slash author jr hanley if you are a coffee drinker and you're drinking two three four five pots a day like the good mr anderson you could get your coffee over at coffee brand coffee on the link provided in the show notes use the code podcast grants and get 10 percent off it is american made american brewed and american source coffee so you know do your part help the local economy and drink good coffee and oh by the way we get a little bit of a kickback uh so far you have paid for three episodes with your coffee addictions and we thank you um and with that being said i would like to thank you for spending some of your precious time with us for my crazy co-host i am jr hanley and this was the blasters and blades podcast we'll be back next week at the same time where we'll indulge our indulge our love of nerd culture cheesy jokes and all things that go boom. Thank you for coming on, Taylor. I could have kept going forever, but I am told that uh, apparently other people have lives and they've got to go do things. So thank you for coming on. Oh, thanks for having me. Enjoy all right. And we will we'll have to have you back uh, again when we talk all the history because this was fun. Okay. You bet.